a little cap on my head. Oh, you're good. You're good. All right. We're going to start in three, two, one. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another edition of the Coach Scott Field Show. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you're at from around the globe. I appreciate you allowing us into your home, whether you're, st you're streaming us on Facebook or maybe you're watching us on Roku or Amazon Fire TV and soon Apple TV. Or you could just be cruising down the road in that hoopty. You know how that is, TC. Hopefully they'll turn that volume up and they'll let us put that flavor in their ear. I'll uh -huh. tell you what. This is where I put sexy into sports talk, and I am so thrilled and honored to have my guest with us here today. My friend, let me tell you something. Let me tell you why you need to be paying attention here this next hour. He is a consensus All-American from DePaul University. He was the second overall draft pick back in 19, is it 82? 82. 82, second overall draft pick behind only James Worthy, James Worthy of UNC. Also two-time NBA All-Star, over 19,400 points scored in his career. That makes him a top 50 scorer for his career. My question is, how come he is not in the NBA? Let's work and try to figure that out here in this next hour as we have an outstanding time talking to my man. Terry Cummings. Terry, how are you today? And we're going to tell everybody how they can interact with us today, my friend. I'm doing fine, man. I'm, in, I'm enjoying uh, this journey. This part of the journey has been a, uh, a really great part of the journey for me. So I'm doing good. Glad good. to be here with you, Scott. Uh, thrilled to have you. It's, it's guests like you that make this show go. Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to use the hashtag T-C-H-O-F. That's for Terry Cummings to the Hall of Fame. With your interactions, send comments, send questions, use the hashtag T-C-H-O-F, and let's get my friend here, Terry Cummings, into that Hall of Fame. Terry, you're going to turn 60 next month. I believe it's March 15th, which is the day after my wife's birthday. So happy early 60th birthday to you, my friend. Thank you. You do the same and, and uh, wishing the same for your wife as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's dive right into it. February mm -hmm. is Black History Month. What mm -hmm. does that mean to Terry Cummings? Well, it's kind of like Valentine's Day and um, Christmas and, and things. We, we tend to want to, uh, you know, just put everything into that one day or so. But I think that Valentine's Day is, I, I think I wrote a... Um, a little footnote on one of my Facebook pages that 364 days of the year, she is my Valentine. But on Valentine's Day, I share her with the world for one day. You know, See, I, I love that. I think that's meaningful. And, and with Black History Month, I'm assuming that that makes it even more special. And you growing up African American in a culture in a divisive society that we live in, what does Black History Month mean to Terry Cummings? Well, it's the, um, it's like a, a lot of people just take a moment and, and just uh, appreciate what that actually means, the cultural part, um, political, um, pop, uh, spiritual, every piece and part of it is, is during that month, uh, recognized, you know, by people all over the country and all over the world. But I, it, again, it's, to me, it's just like, you know, with Christmas and, and other holidays, if we can do it for one day, how can we do, um, how come we can't do it for two or the whole year? How come we can't just set our minds on shifting, not that the whole world is about black history, but black history is a part of the world. And that's, that's the really more important factor is that we understand the role that we all play overall, but we have to pronounce black history more because you know, Scott, to be honest, when you go back and look at things, uh, the history that we have been taught is, is, it does, is not as relevant in the bigger picture because we're only taught a portion of it. Whereas if we were taught all of it, then we would have a true American history because that's what we are. And we may be African-Americans, but by nature, we are Americans. We were born here. We have learned the laws of the land here. You know, we've been trained and reared here in America. We're Americans. 
See, I, I love that. And I think that's eloquently said and very well articulated. So, so TC, I appreciate you. You grew up playing basketball. I, I grew up born and raised in Indiana, and I was blessed to have been a Hall of Famer at my high school in Indiana. Didn't have near the accolades that, that you accomplished. Why is Chicago basketball so phenomenal? And why are so many great stars coming out of the city of Chicago? It's the competition. I mean, um, if you really want to be great at what you do, then cut your teeth on people that are great. And one of the greatest things uh, for me was I was a late bloomer, considered a blue chip, you know, came under the radar. I didn't go to any of the uh, big camps. I only went to Athletes for Better Education with Forrest. Um, and so, you know, one of the things that I was told early is we traveled to universities. We traveled uh, east side, west side, north side, south side of Chicago. And we played against the best talent all the time, even in the playgrounds, Cold Park, you know, Scanlon uh, on the south side. Uh, we would go to BBR, you know, which is like lower uh, on the west side and then lower north on the north side. We were playing against the best players all over the city. And they were not all recognized players. They were players that, I either did not go to high school, dropped out of high school, but they were the, some of the greatest ballers that you you will never ever have heard of. You haven't heard of, but these were the people we cut our teeth on, you know, and and we took that that whole reality into the league with us. See, and and I do believe that steel sharpens steel, and if you mm -hmm. can be out there playing against the best every day, uh, you're only going to get better, and you are obviously a product of that environment because Chicago basketball is phenomenal. I mean, I've, I've coached several players from Chicago and I mean, I, I think of some great talent that have, that has come out of there. And, and again, you, you are definitely one of those. And I'm sure if there are people out there that have that barber shop talk, man, Terry Cummings name has got to be coming up in, in, in the top, you know, top 10. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I've always thought, uh, never to take it for granted that it is truly an honor to be in the conversation. And I have never been the flamboyant, uh, outspoken uh, as it pertains to my ability, because I was raised by a group of older cats that taught me, um, let what you do speak for you and not you. Because if you're talking about what you're doing, it's probably not as good as you say it is. And you have to fluff it up, you know, for, for my career, you know, I know a lot of guys that play, you know, 15, 16 years that don't have my numbers. And, and really, my numbers don't really tell the whole story of, of the, the player, um, the philanthropist, you know, the, the outreach person that was just doing, doing things because I love doing what I do and love being who I am. But, you know, my first 10 years, you know, 21, 22 points a game, nine or 10 boards, and then the last seven, eight, you know, after I torn my ACL, I had a whole nother reflection, Scott, on my life. Yeah. And um, I started to um, stop chasing after the ring and started looking at life from a different perspective and chose that perspective, but worked as hard as I could to win a ring at the same time. But it was no longer my primary goal in the sense that I realized these young cats needed a mentor. They needed a leader. They needed somebody. So I was shifted from uh, my stay in San Antonio. And then I went to back to Milwaukee for a year. And then I went to Seattle. And I mean, in these, I got to play with Vin Baker, Glenn Robinson in Milwaukee. Got to go to Seattle and play with Gary Payton and Sean and those guys. Then I went from there to uh, uh, Philadelphia where I played with Allen Iverson and Derek Coleman and those guys. But I was always referred to these teams by coaches I either played for or had relationships with in the past. And they didn't bring me in there to sit on the bench because I was still playing. I was the go-to man in Golden State at 39, 40 years old. That's right. In the in fourth quarter of games. So it was is not it was not just because um of balling, but it was balling and leadership. And these two things really go hand in hand for me. And if it, if it ain't ball in this ministry or business or fatherhood, they go hand in hand. Leadership is the key piece because you know, if the head is sick, the whole body is sick. So if that is true, since that is true, if the, if the head is whole and complete, then the whole body is whole and complete. And so I referred uh, to, to 
to my stats more often than not because I realized the last seven or eight years that I never averaged over 10 points a game. But I was the better player in those years, a, a more complete player than I was in the prior 10 years. You know, because I didn't have to concentrate on one or two things. I could I could play defense, I could rebound. I they put men game shutdown guys, whether they were five, four, or three centers, power forwards, or small forwards. See, I, I like that, TC, because you think about how the game is driven today and it's all about analytics, but that doesn't tell you about the player's heart. It doesn't tell yeah. you about his contributions on the bench, in the locker room, you mm -hmm. know, what, what other tangibles that he brings to the court to make that team, because it's still a team game Absolutely. Uh, you know, to, to be effective. So, TC, I'm, I'm glad you say that because I, I think that also needs to be addressed. And, and I heard – you know, as you were describing that, I heard that old school, and they call us old heads now, but yeah. that old school mentality where, you know what, you're going to do whatever it takes to be successful individually right. and collaboratively, collaboratively and collectively on the court. And, you know, I, I've got a whole list of, you know, research here and questions that I want to ask, but I love some of the conversations that you're talking about. So again, for our viewers out there who are watching this, Ladies and gentlemen, this is Terry Cummings and just an amazing man. I mean, we can talk about all the accolades, about the 19,400 points, a top 50 career score, but this man is now an ordained minister and he is about community and is about service. And he does use his platforms to educate and inspire others. And that's what our show is all about. And that's why I couldn't wait to have you come on the show to kind of talk about you know, crawl before you walk, walk before you run, and how Terry Cummings has evolved as an individual on and off the court. So, Terry, I appreciate you. And again, if you're out there, send comments and questions. And again, use that hashtag TCHOF. Because again, in my eyes, I'm a former NBA and FIBA basketball coach that's so had a lot of success. But I know when I see someone who deserves to be in the hall of fame and i think that's what this discussion is all about my friend so i know you're very humble and it's probably hard for you to hear that but like you said let your contributions and your stats do the talking you've mm -hmm. done that so now let's 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 let the muscle you know muscle meet the hustle and let's get you in the hall of fame i'm all i'm all for that i think at this point in my life you know you you know, you start to look at things not from the perspective you did in your 20s, 30s, or 40s, or even yeah. your 50s. You're looking at it from a legacy perspective. You know, what um, What have I done? You know, what can I leave behind for my kids? I have 10 grandchildren. I mean, for them to reflect upon and uh, things that could establish. And then there's the countless thousands of people that, you know, I didn't just start ministry when I retired. I've been in ministry since I was 16 years old. Right. You know, and so I started pastoring. I'm pastoring a, a church here in the Atlanta area and going on um, 13 years with that. Uh, wow. It's been it's been um, it's been a ride because um, the one, you know, the irony, Scott, about life is that many of the things that you don't really want to do are the things most necessary for you to do to become who you really are supposed to be. And pastoring did that for me. I mean, you know, having to work with people closely, you know, whereas a prof as a professional athlete, a lot of times you keep your privacy and your space. But in pastoring, you're not afforded that because people have real needs and you can't afford to fabricate the truth or the lifestyle or the manner in which people live. You got to give them something uh, that is exactly what they need, not always what they want, you know. But I, I'm personally... I've been I've been blessed. I've been blessed because I played in a business in a profession for 18 years where the average guy only lasts three or four years. To me, that's grace. You know, yeah. it's truly a grace from God. See, TC, I I love hearing how faith based you are. And that means a lot to me because I'm also a man of spirit. And uh, you know, basketball was a passion that you were blessed with and it mm -hmm. gave you a platform but now ministry is your purpose and to serve others. And I think that's a beautiful thing. And I feel like that needs to be, that, that needs to be known more and more awareness should be brought to that. So, man, I'm so glad we can use this platform today to let everybody know what a TC is now doing. And I'm thinking of 
the hundreds of thousands of lives that you have positively impacted throughout your career and now post-career, which again is the most valuable thing. And that's what I feel like a lot of these NBA rookies and players who are coming up who don't have that foresight and don't have, you know, they, 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 they're they only living for today instead right. of living for five years from now and 10 years from now. So TC, God bless you, brother. Keep doing what you're doing. Mm-hmm. And, and I think it's phenomenal work. I will. You do the same, Scott. I really appreciate this platform. I never take for granted when people open up their platform to you because, you know, there's a script that says that we are to be careful how we build on another man's foundation. And um, for me, I often think about it uh, in regards to, you know, the smallest the, or the greatest platform. Always be respectful of it because the platform is a bridge that you cross over to go and you cross over to come back. So you handle it with the care, though, it, as though it was yours. Because oh. until you can be trusted with somebody else's stuff, you won't. You won't hardly ever have your own. Ooh. Preach right there, brother. Thank you for sharing that. Mm-hmm. Um, let's 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 backtrack a little bit and get into more of the basketball journey that a lot of people know Terry Cummings for. You got to play for legendary coach Ray Meyer. What was some of the things and life lessons that he taught you that impacted a young 19, 20 year old Terry Cummings? The, the two, two probably most prolific things was he taught me to be colorblind. Uh, Cause I wasn't, when I got there, I grew up in an all black area and um, I had never been around so many white folk in my life till I got to college. <laughs> Wow, so it was okay. a, that's, it that's was just a keeping it real shock. right there. Yeah, it was a culture shock. Uh, the second thing was Ray uh, did something that only a few men in my life did for me. And that was he did not sugarcoat the path. Uh, he did not uh, waylay things in the journey. He merely allowed me to be a man. If you were a young man that came to DePaul and you wanted to be a man, Ray gave you that opportunity. And the way he did it, was difficult for some of the um, players I played with. But the way he did it was he allowed you to work your way out and through the things you were going through. And some people might have said, well, he, he doesn't have any control over these guys. No, that was his control. His control was to allow you as a young man to see your era, work at getting out of it because his generation did the same thing. Yeah. You know, he was just merely giving us uh, – the perspective from his reflection point. I mean, that's all we can do anyway. We can only reflect from where where our experiences are. We we can do all the talking we want to, but where we are the most productive is is in those areas where we have experienced something. Yes, but Larry, uh, uh, Coach Ray was was a was a father figure. Um, he was a tremendous person, and I will always I always adhere uh, to that those two things because they were the things that really helped make me and get me ready for the rest of my life, not just wow. for b-ball. Wow. That's, that's wonderful stuff right there. Thanks for sharing, you know, watching, you know, his programs from afar and then, you know, his son, Joey coming in taking over the program. But I also think of the greats that played for legendary coach uh, Ray Meyer. And again, me being a coach, I always look things through that coach's lens. Right. And I love to hear, you know, what impact he had on your life. And then I think too, the players that were in that program, what did you take from Mark Aguirre? Well, Mark was um, a hybrid. He was the first of his kind um, at DePaul, and he was really unusual to the the whole, you know, scenery of uh, college basketball, flamboyant, uh, scoring machine. He could do whatever was necessary to to win and um, just his own, he was a personality. You know, I hadn't grown up around anyone like Mark. Uh, and uh, it, it was a learning experience to to play alongside him and not to feel as though I was being um, chided in, in any way because of his success. Because I, I remember we had a team meeting once and uh, in the team meeting, there were plenty of guys complaining that Mark was getting all the attention. And I stood up in the meeting and I told him, I said, you all don't get it, do you? I said, when that camera rolls, it does not just roll on Mark McGuire. It rolls on anybody that's out there that the lens captures. And I said, and when that lens is rolling, 
you need to be doing your job. Because if you get caught on camera doing your job, then for all those who have aspirations of going to the next level, you know, somebody's going to see you. But if you're sitting out there complaining, waiting for something to happen for you that you didn't earn, you know, it's not going to go down that way. Uh, Terry, I like that. I, and I think those are great nuggets for, you know, other aspiring athletes who are out there watching. To me, this is all about providing tools for your toolbox. And you're dropping so many nuggets right now that I hope these people and young players that are out there are soaking this up like a sponge because I'm going to tell you what, this stuff is golden. Thank you for that. Yeah. Um, you yeah. know, another NBA player that you were able to play with at DePaul, who is very popular out here where I live. I'm in Salt Lake City in Utah. Tyrone Corbin. Yeah. You were able to play with Tyrone Corbin. What's the first thing that comes to your mind when I say Tyrone Corbin? Well, I recruited him. Back then, they would let us recruit the players to the school. Yeah. The players Come, coming out have. of South Carolina, I believe. Yeah, yeah. I <laughs> recruited him to. Um, I was the one that was there uh, recruiting him for the school. Uh, one of the things about uh, Tyrone, when you first mentioned his name, I mean, a tireless kind of a worker. I mean, and just um, always on point, just the upstanding kind of guy, you know, that that is just, you know, he walks in integrity and character. And I mean, Amen. balling, balling to me is not complicated. You, you know, we're all born with talents. I think the most difficult piece uh, for any athlete person in general is the integrity um, of, of who you are and the integrity of what you produce. Because you, if you lack in our void of integrity, then whatever you do will always be suspect. And what I mean by suspect, people will always challenge it. And they're going to challenge it anyway. Yeah. But when you have no integrity and you don't know the value of your positioning, um, you're a liability to everybody because you don't know who you are. Yeah. That's, see, that's Ty, Ty was Ty, Ty was a, a special player. Yeah. And, and like you said, a wonderful person and just a mm -hmm. great character. And he has a wonderful wife and family. And I, I you know, I've, I've really enjoyed my interactions and time around uh, Coach Corbin. And, you know, he, he's gone on to do some great things, you know, at the right. coaching level. And, and again, I just keep thinking of what a powerful tool it is to be able to impact so many lives. And again, that character and that credibility and that integrity that you're talking about. These are life skills that that need to be continued to taught to our youth today because they are our future and they are our future community leaders. So I, I think it's important to to hit on, hit on those key notes. So so thank oh, yeah. you for that. Yeah. Um, yeah, wonderful stuff, Terry. I, this is just wonderful. Um, I, I think now let let's okay. Now we're going post career with mm -hmm. you know a, a all American, and now you know you're drafted into the NBA. Was it motivation for you when James Worthy was selected number one and you were selected number two, but yet in the bouting that year, you won rookie of the year. And then I think Clark Kellogg came in number two and yeah. James Worthy was number three. Was that, did that fuel your passion to play to like, Hey, I'm Terry Cummings. I'm on this court and let, let's see what happens. Well, you know, the, the irony Scott was that um, I knew I knew I could play in the NBA and I knew that I was as good as anybody and better than most. And um, I, when, when I came into the league, I had been playing against pros since the time I was 16 in the pro-am in Chicago. There so go. I was, I had already cut my teeth on knowing, even though in the summer, a lot of cats not in the best of shape, you know, but I know that any guy that plays in the, in the league on the league level has enough integrity about himself. If he's going to go up against some young um, upstart, you know, they're going to be on top of their game if it ain't but for 15 or 20 minutes. And um, for me, um, when I got to the league, I set out the, 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 the preseason uh, contract negotiations <clears throat> and I missed a few of the early games. But I think my first game uh, might have been in Milwaukee which I would later play, play six years for it. But then the second game was in Indianapolis against Clark Kellogg. And, and um, but I started putting up numbers right away, but I was very uh, deflated. I thought that no matter how much I did, the Clippers weren't going to win. And, and I, I was taking it personal. And I think that that was part of the physical issue I had is I've never enjoyed losing. It's yeah. never been at the top of my list. You know, I do realize that uh, you'll learn more through losing than winning. 
but you don't have to keep losing to gain that knowledge, right. you know. Hey, <laughs> losing builds character. Just don't be a cartoon, right? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and when I when I hear you say that, Terry, I hear your mindset because your mindset is already, you know, elite level players. They want to be coached. And I heard you talking about that with Coach Ray Meyer. You know, he didn't give you fluff. He was direct. He told you what you needed to do. And so I, right. that's what I took from what you shared with that. But yet I also hear, too, a quiet confidence in Terry Cummings because you had a mindset to compete and go out there and earn your respect. You were not enabled. You, you, you wanted to inflict your will on the game, and you did that when you stepped in those lines for that 94 feet. Absolutely. And again, you know, the, the game, everybody has physical skills at that level, but that mindset is what's going to set apart that top 5% so you can be a one percenter to compete at the highest levels. And correct me if I'm wrong in that statement. No, you, you're correct. In fact, I think that the best uh, perspective of it is a, a reporter came to me uh, after I had been in the league about maybe eight years. And he said, you know what? He said, I, I, I get something about you I don't think everybody else gets. He said, you're cocky, but you're not arrogant. Mm. And, um, and the thing is, is um, I, I agreed with him because the cockiness was, was just saying, I belong here. I can do this. You know, I am. Just I am, and That's yeah, what that was. Yeah, I, I, I'm. I'm gonna be a force to be reckoned with until I leave this game. How many times I was on the court and I could hear coaches screaming at the referees, "Watch TC, watch him!" or calling <laughs> to the press, "He's trying to go left," you know, or go double him up, you know, and, and that tells you, you know, that people uh, have a respect, you know, uh, uh, for who you are uh, as a baller, but. I would think that um, if I had one thing that I would want to be respected for is the integrity that I maintain, not only for the game and the league, but for the, the brothers, black or white or other, that I played with in or against, and the uh, character that we carried ourselves in that I was taught by guys who were older than myself. And it brings me to a point with, um, in high school, my coach Horace Howard taught me a lesson that stayed with me for life and helped me when I got to DePaul. He had juniors and seniors on the squad when I came in as a sophomore because I only played two years of high school ball. He set me down the whole year. He would not let me play my sophomore year. But in my junior and senior year, I just went crazy. You know, got to the, uh, and he would not play me in front of his juniors and seniors who had been there. He told me I had to wait my time. So when I got to DePaul, as soon as I got there, uh, not really clearly knowing, Graydon didn't know what they had in me, but they told me, you you're gonna have to sit behind Mark and wait. This is his team. So for two years, after I had had the experience in high school, for two years I sat behind and I waited for my opportunity. And there's not enough said uh, these days about it because cats leave so soon, you know, oh, and they don't, they don't stay long enough to learn the things that would make going to the next level easier for them. But for me, after my experience in high school, the one in college was easy. I just I sat back and waited, and then um, just so happens a few games into the junior season, we played Louisville on national TV, and I explode thirty seven point night, ten fifteen boards, eighteen boards, and the rest is kind of history after that. I mean, I don't have the legacy, for instance, of a Mark McGuire in um, high school because I I was a late bloomer. I didn't go to the camps. I didn't. Uh, I only made I made uh, honorable All American in high school. But I made All-American, uh, first team, I believe, All-American in college. But I never had those accolades. I always had to work as though I was under the radar, you know, and always being undervalued. And But the thing that kept me was that I knew who I was. And I played like it every time I got on the court. I always believed that my best would be left on the court. Because when I get off the court, I didn't have to go home and talk basketball because I did the best I could do. I left it on the court and my friends and family said, how come you don't talk basketball? I said, because basketball ain't everything that I am. It's my job. It's what I do for a living, you know, and I don't want to bring it home. I got a wife and two kids and I want them to be able to enjoy their father. I want them to see me as the man of the house, not as Terry Cummins, the ball player. Yeah, see, and I, I think that's wonderful. And I, I'm taking so many nuggets from what you're just sharing and I want to kind of, 
emphasize those things because you had uh, people want they if the press wanted to call it cockiness you had self-awareness you had self-confidence but you had to earn it you didn't mm -hmm. have a sense of entitlement where these young kids today they're just jumping with grassroots basketball aau team to aau team if this coach ain't playing me they're going to go somewhere else and now you see this transfer portal now where nobody has patience to go earn it and where mm -hmm. you had to earn it and you were taught to earn that uh i think is something that that is truly missing within our fabric uh with mm -hmm. with teaching soft skills and life skills to these young men that we as coaches are failing these players because we're, we're, we're just giving them something just like when i grew up in indiana we didn't have classification basketball you saw the movie hoosiers it was the big schools versus the little schools and those were wonderful life lessons to learn because it wasn't just a participation trophy given out uh, let's mm -hmm. get rid of that let's make people earn it and yeah. I, I feel like your character is going to be rewarded for that and and again let's go back to that and and terry and your thanks durability. for sharing that yeah your durability is a big piece too because oh, your durability man. is built around constancy which is your ability to be faithful and constant at what you do um you know that most kids may not know this and a lot of veteran players probably don't either practice is not the time for you to work on your game that's right and and, and i mean not just in the off season but during the season um what we would do is come into practice, come before practice about an hour or so, work on our game. Yeah. Then you got an hour and a half, two hour practice, to and then you work team. on your game some more. That's right. Then you work on your individual game some more at the end of practice. You do weights and all that other stuff that's connected to it. And 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 the young cats used to come in and say, T, you, you work really hard. I said, yeah, because somebody's coming to get your job. That's right. And if you're not prepared to fight to maintain your, your position and your job, I said, you'll be out of this business in no time. And a lot of the young guys didn't get it. You know, you it's not about superstardom. That stuff comes and goes. I mean, every every star has had a day where they were no longer a star, yeah. you know, where the, the bright lights didn't shine on them as bright. You know, nobody was calling their names. It's one of the first things you notice when you retire. Nobody, the phone don't ring no more. You know, and you better be prepared for it well before you get there. Because, you know, for me, I didn't need people to tell me who I was. Yeah. So it wasn't a requirement that they had to pat me on the back every time I did something. You know, it's good to have once in a while. But most of the time I knew that was my job. Yeah. Yeah. You well, know? see, again, that's where that strong character and that integrity that you had was able to shine through. Because if you don't have that character and that mindset to say, OK, as I transition and evolve after the game, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to serve mm -hmm. others. I'm going to help people. And I, and again, I think those are, are lessons to be learned. And, uh, you know, thank you for shining the light on that and, and being that consummate role model for individuals, because again, we need to, we need more of that, Terry. And I, I hope the NBA reaches out to you and you go talk to these rookies at this rookie symposium and you share these guys to say, Hey, quit thinking about today. You know, quit thinking about, you know, survival today. You know, what are your five year goals? What are your 10 year goals? What are you going to do five years after your playing days are done? Because you don't know when an injury is going to hit you. We don't know yeah. what's going to happen with you, but are you going to have that strong character and are you going to have that integrity, you know, to be able to serve others? And I think that, you know, I, I hope the NBA takes advantage of, of a Terry Cummings to, to use you in, in that capacity. And, and they would. I've been quiet about Terry Cummings because I've been working, doing other things. But I think it's very difficult for uh, things to transition from um, one generation to another. It's difficult enough. Um, but if, you know, I, I've been opposed to the thought of, of many of my uh, um peers uh, to take offense in this younger generation. In fact, I've been asked a lot in the last few years, you know, could this group play with us? And, and um, no, and, and not because we were so much better than them, but because our rules, they couldn't play under. Yeah, the and, physicality, and in, and, yes, Yeah, right. yeah, and in like manner, I think it would be very difficult for us to play under their rules if we had the same mindset that we were trained with, which was to use our body because the, the structure of the NBA went from you can use your forearm to defend. You can use yep. your hands. Yep. You Post can use your hand. chest. Arm you arm. know, 
till you Bump can't touch cutters. nobody. <laughs> yeah, you can't touch nobody, which is where we are right now. And yeah, and and I don't know that they understand that taking away the physicality um, has hurt the game in so many ways. I think it's it's necessary when we see physicality, especially for the purest. The away. purest of the game will definitely mm -hmm. feel that way. Oh yeah, but the thing is that the game can stand for itself. It's much like children when people start complaining about the struggles that children are going through, whether it's cancer, you know, childhood cancer or whatever it is. Uh, I often tell them, I said, "You are um, disrespecting these children." I said, "These children are more resilient than you are as a grown-up because they don't have as much life experience to measure things by. We we get into the troubles, we do the doubts and the fears because we've seen so much more." But yeah. children don't have that. They're, that's why they overcome things quicker than we do, because they're resilient. And if you tell them they can make it, they, they don't have to look into a whole closet full of experiences to know that they can make it because they believe since you said it. You know, and, and a lot of that is what we do. Pastoring to me is like coaching. It's always encouraging uh, people to be better than they think they are, you know, and get them to the point where they see that better and then start to achieve it. You know, you and you yep. you push them in whatever way you can. You love them with tough love. You love them with agape love. You get them in position however you can. You give them the um, the different versions of life so that they're balanced. You don't want people going out there and you know leaning on one side. You know yeah, that's true. <laughs> and, and you know, and you know, Terry, you are so great at that because not only can you communicate, but you can effectively communicate and reinforce positive structure, but yet you're also providing hope. And if mm -hmm. we can provide hope for the youth and we can provide hope for our communities, and if we can provide hope for society, that gives us something to grab onto. And we mm -hmm. need more of that positive reinforcement throughout the fabric of society and you know that that's why i love the life lessons because there's so many parallels with sports to life and if you can translate sports life lessons to your life away from the game or whatever you know you choose to do with your life and, and your passions and, and your purposes positive things will happen we need more Always. positivity and hope out there in society and i love that you bring that because i i listen to your messages on social media with your ministry and and, and brother I, i'm with you man i'm with you i appreciate that yeah yeah, yeah. so uh, let's let's got dive into more questions because i feel like people will learn from hearing from you mm -hmm. um you know you're you're drafted to the san diego clippers you're with coach paul silas i believe mm -hmm. but yeah but bill walton was on that team swin nader swin, swin, another ucla guy. yeah <laughs> so what what did you take away from bill walton who had a, an illustrious college career and again affected by injuries but I mean, he's probably wearing tie-dye t-shirts and grateful dead but what did you take <laughs> away from bill walton yeah bill was was basically a seven-foot hippie <laughs> you know, there you go. <laughs> uh, I, I, uh, I watched him and he gave life lessons to me as well, not just about basketball, but about the system of how the system was set up. And um, as a young player coming in, I remember telling him at one point I had got so tired. The practices were long, not with Paul Silas, but with Jim Lynham the second year. Oh, yeah. And, um, and um, I remember him sitting down telling me, he said, T, there's nothing in your contract that says you have to practice. And I thought to myself, <laughs> that is a true Bill Walton quote. <laughs> that, that, that's an Allen Iverson startup right there. Practice. Uh, We're talking about practice. <laughs> yeah, but you know, back then you you uh, you didn't have uh, a lot of these liberties. These cats take off days and stuff. You know, we oh, yeah, What's even load off management? day. What there was no load management in the eighties yeah. and nineties. <laughs> well, I mean, it's it's made easier for them, and it's still complicated. And 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 a lot of it is I get because I used to think the season was longer than it needed to be, but the thing is, is we were so tempered for an eighty-two game season that we 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 prided ourselves on pacing ourselves into the last 30 40 games there you know you win go. the games you're supposed to win as a, uh, i learned in milwaukee you win the games you're supposed to win and they give you the right to play in the big games that nobody expects you to win oh i like that terry i like mm -hmm. that let's let's do a little rapid fire i want you to say the first word that comes to your mind 
after I mention some of these NBA coaches' names and what you took for them. Okay, you ready? Mm-hmm. Let me get my list out here because you play for some great coaches. So yes. you get Paul Silas. What's the first word that comes to your mind? Man, steady, steady, real okay. steady, dirty, quiet, but right to the point. I like that. Okay, Don Nelson, Nelly. Uh, the consummate uh, coach, teacher, mentor, philosopher. Um, I mean, just he was the the at the apex for me in the in in the whole process. Yeah, I I, I got to be around him when my friend Keith Smart allowed me to come out and be at the NBA summer league. And of course, Nelly was the head coach. Key smart was the top assistant coach at the time. And that's when Steph Curry was a rookie. And man, I loved hearing how he taught the big man. You know, most screens are set down here, but he wanted guys to sit up here because that way they could catch the ball turn and then make a quick. And I thought that's, that's brilliant. Why why aren't more people doing that? So he's an innovator. for And one, one, and that's, that's the point. One word I didn't mention is he is probably of all the coaches, one of the greatest, innovators of the game the game that is being played in the league right now is his game it started in milwaukee you know then uh dallas then then Golden state i'm not sure the, the order of that uh but they all played the draw and kick game it all started in milwaukee with don nelson that's right well said how about larry brown man the most intense coach uh great teacher great man you know um and I have a, a lot of respect for him on a different level because he and I had a run-in that was not meant to be a run-in, but it, it became a run-in because a reporter friend of mine put it in the newspaper, a conversation that we were having. And the reporter, uh, P. Vesey, said oh, that he, uh, he thought it wasn't, uh, he, he thought it was just news. You didn't tell me, woo, woo, woo. And so we playing the game and I hope you have time just to share this. It won't take long. Uh, so in the locker room after this game, I come in and the reporters are all over my locker and I come in and say, what is going on? I didn't even have a good game, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And, uh, they said, well, we, you know, this, this article in the newspaper, uh, that Peter Bessie wrote and woo, woo, woo. And, um, I remember, uh, Larry coming in he was huffing and puffing and me and Larry always were close. We didn't always agree, but he respected my opinion and I always respected his. And so. When I heard what the issue was and Larry came in, he said, TC, did you do this? Did you say these things? And I said, yeah, I said them. And just like that, I said, um, you owned it. But I didn't mean, I didn't mean for them to come out like that because then these are nothing, these are nothing than words that you and I haven't talked about. He said, I know, but that guy there, you know, basically, you know, they had, they were bumping heads. Yeah. Him and Pete Vesey. So. Yeah. But that was an integrity moment for me because I could have lied, but it wouldn't have been yeah. it wouldn't have been good for me because as it turns out, uh, some years later, well, yeah. he was coaching me in San Antonio. Yeah. He calls me up when he's in Philadelphia and he says to me, I want you to come and help me with these young kids. And these young kids were Allen Iverson, Derek Coleman, uh, Wingate, all of those guys. So I wind up uh, because of the way I handled myself in San Antonio. I got a job in Philadelphia. And see, that's the ultimate sign of respect because mm-hmm. respect was earned. And when coach Larry Brown calls you to come be a mentor for these young guys, because he knew what you brought to the table, that, that wasn't about how many rebounds and how many points you're getting. It's like, Hey, help me groom these young men because they got a chance to be special. And he Absolutely. called upon you. That's yeah. powerful. And that's, that's very humbling. Very humbling. Oh, yes, sir. <laughs> When I traveled throughout the globe, I got flags all over my studio here of all the countries that I coached in. And a reporter once compared me to Larry Brown because he said, you guys win everywhere you go. And for my name to be mentioned in the same sentences as Larry Brown, I was like, mm-hmm. whoa, that meant a lot to me, Terry. Great, I'm not going to lie. Great, great, great guy. And it's, oh, it is great truly guy. great to be mentioned in the same breath. Oh, I, hey, I, I, I don't deserve it. <laughs> Just like you owned your, your your statement, I own that I don't belong in the same breath as a Larry Brown. Come on, he won in college. He won at the pro. That that guy, he's phenomenal. But you also got to play. Did you play for George Carl? Actually, I did in Seattle. Yeah, with Nate and McMillan and Kim. And yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> What's Griff, the first one that comes Payton. to mind with Coach Carl? Man, uh, another he to me is cut out of the cloth of uh, Don Nelson. He's a great innovator. Yeah. Uh, and the thing that both he and Don Nelson had in common and, and Larry Brown to a degree, too, is they were great people, 
people, you know, because there are coaches that are great in X and O's, but don't understand or know the personalities. If you don't learn the personalities of your players, you it's, it's, it's difficult for you to write up a play for a player that you don't know what his capabilities are. I mean, not what you, what you want them to be, but what they are. Yeah. And, and coaching philosophically is difficult for most people because you think that if a player is uh, for a four or five game stretch doing only certain things that that's all he can do. But a, a game, every game is different and every player is different. And the coach has to be willing, willing to see the growth in his players too. Amen. Amen to that. I, I'm a huge advocate for everything that you're saying there. And I got to echo those sentiments. So thank you for sharing that. You know, you've met, we, we talked about some of the great coaches that you, that you've played for and played with, and then mentioned some of the players that you were also with mm -hmm. the Admiral David Robinson. What did mm -hmm. you take from him? Well, actually um, the year David and Sean Elliott came into the league was the, the, the time I was traded from Milwaukee to San Antonio. And um, they told me they were sending me there. They were trading me there to help make it easier for those two. Uh, David is wow. uh, a hybrid kind of big guy. And Sean is a hybrid kind of middle of the road guy. And um, both of them were great, tremendous personalities and people, uh, great players uh, in their own right, uh, with a lot of history behind them from high school, college, and, and even in the league. And David was... Uh, he and I were stuck to each other like glue while I was in uh, San Antonio. So he was one of the first ones I mentored him and then Sean and then wow. Avery, when Avery came along. I was given, gumbo. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was given the opportunity to, to really uh, uh, have a narrative in, into their lives. And I, I knew that it was important to do it right. Even in the areas where I was, I was having issues with my own life. I made, I was transparent enough to move past it. Oh, but see, those I two, love. two, I love them too. Yeah, good. Just but see again, there's that magnetism because character draws other character, and mm -hmm. you know what? I, I think that's probably why that magnetism was there. Um, I had a question sent in to me, and, and I wanted to break this. Not your first All Star appearance, but your second All Star game. What do you remember about your second All Star game? Because I think Carl Malone might have been MVP of that, but. Talk to us about, I mean, I'm sure the first one was like, wow, I'm, a, I'm an NBA all-star. And you walk in that locker room and you look around the talent and you knew you belonged. But what about the second all-star game, walking in that locker room? What memories do you have of that second all-star appearance? It's been so long, Scott. <laughs> yeah. but I, I, I think what it was, if, if I remember correctly, um, my mom and, and uh, dad came to the first one, and that, that was the most special for me. Mm -hmm. And the second one, I think it was uh, myself, Larry Bird, and Mike. We were sitting uh, on the floor, and we were just chit-chatting. And, and, and in that moment, you know, I felt like, wow. I mean, I watched Larry Bird, Larry Bird you know, in, in the uh, college finals. You know, I, I've watched Michael Jordan come along and, and we've gotten to play against him all these years. And here I am right in the middle of, of these two great players. And um, it reminded me of something my middle boy TJ said to me once we were living uh, in San Antonio and the, the, we lived next door to this big time doctor. And uh, TJ had gone over to their house and he came back and he was just like flabbergasted. He said, Dad the people next door to us are rich. And I started laughing. And he said, he said, well, what's so funny, dad? I said, cause you live next door to him. Wow. You know? And so to be in the, in, in that vicinity with those great players, it made me understand that whether I want to call it greatness or not, I belong here. You know, I belong I, here. I, I love that, man. We, so, so much detail i mean gosh we we could talk for hours terry and i love this because i love the insights that you're sharing you know we talked about all those other players but how about alan iverson and you know that question that came before i want to give jay brand right a, a shout out because he's just a phenomenal journalist and a great writer and he wanted mm. to know what your you know thoughts were on that second all-star appearance and so thank you jay for that but mm. what were your impressions with 
a young Allen Iverson because when you think of Allen Iverson from a coaching lens, I think of how he impacted a culture, whether it's positive mm-hmm. or negatively, he mm-hmm. brought change to the league, whether people would judge him for his dress or his attitude. But I look at a little six foot, 160 pound competitor, but what did you see with Allen Iverson and what he brought to the game and to the culture? He was a more contemporary version of a Nate Archibald. Ooh, you know, great. He, comp- he okay. was a uh, very uh, talented, gifted uh, things. It was just easier for Al because of the nature of how he saw the game and played the game. He was a very good person in spite of what people would think. You know, I got to spend time with him. And, I mean, I have a lot of respect for him because I think it's difficult for people to get uh, maximum exposure to be treated like common people because people won't let you be treated that way. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, even in my time spent with Michael Jordan um, during the summers, you know, I would have people come up and say, I think he's arrogant. I said, well, I think for who he is and what he accomplishes, he's more humble than most people who will never get there. You know, it's easy point. for you to, you know, to uh, talk about the Allen Iversons and the MJs of the world, but you'll never sit in their seat or wear their shoes. You know, and it's it's difficult enough, you know, uh, for 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 common people to have a, a an opportunity. But then when you become a part of that, I think you call that one percenter group. Um, and I, I talked about that with David, David Stern one year. We were having a shutdown and he called me and asked me, um, did I think what I thought about the uh, lockout? And I told him, I said, well, your lockout is not about. Uh, about 85 to 90 percent of the players in the league it's about that five or ten percent you choose to market above everybody else those are the ones you're going to have a problem with the rest of us we want to play and get paid for our services oh yep yeah see and and, and i like that because i I think that's well put because again what i'm calling a one percenter it's easy for everybody to sit back and judge someone who has attained the highest levels Mm -hmm. of a certain industry and they're the best of the best the elite so that one percent so how can 99 percent sit there on twitter nowadays and just blow people up when you don't even know anything about them but yet you're going to judge them for maybe how they look or how they dress when you don't know their heart or their character or their soul and i think that's a that's a great statement and and alan was uh i'll say this he was a pioneer in that you know when you say culture uh, I know what you mean. Most people may not know. It's not just basketball. He affected the culture of the league by virtue of his hip hop lifestyle, yeah. you know, and, and his manner in which he prepared. Man, look, I played with Al for about a year. Uh, we would have shoot arounds in different cities that may come at about 11 o'clock in the morning. Well, Al is just getting in, you know, yes. and and so it was he was he was funny. But now. He could miss a practice or come to practice and sit down. But when game time came, he was prepared to play. Yeah. You yeah, know, see, that's, that's right. And that's, and that's, that's, that's a state, a st- you know, we had a, a conversation with Rick Barry a few weeks ago and he talked about that. He's like, man, do you want me to perform and go hundred percent at 10 o'clock in the morning at shoot around? Or do you want me at a hundred percent at seven o'clock when the lights are on and the popcorn's popping? Wh- which do yeah. you want? <laughs> well, that, that would be the conversation we would have. I would uh, tell the coaches, I say, look, you could either have this now or you can have it at game time. And for me, I enjoy practicing because I knew it kept my rhythm up and kept me sharp. But for other players, you know, they they were discontent about practice. And sometimes I get it. You know, it's a long schedule. You know, it's and, and we played, and most of the teams I played on, we played very hard in practice. Yeah. So it was very competitive. And if you were not a competitive person, you would you wouldn't want to do this. Yeah. Yeah, see, that, that's a la Michael Jordan that was easily documented in The Last Dance that a lot of people mm-hmm. or this new generation was introduced to, which just reinforced what our generation knew. But it's like everybody grew up with Kobe, but watch with Michael Jordan on YouTube. And all of a sudden, The Last Dance showed how, how he challenged those players and practices and, you know, made it competitive because he knew he needed them, you know, when, when it was, you know, championship ring time, right? Yeah, but the thing is, is I'm going to say this in um, – full disclosure mj wasn't the only one pushing people and and the bulls weren't the only teams that were playing hard and practice you know is the the issue um 
if there is one, is that they're the team that won the six championships, but they could not be as good as people consider them to be if they didn't cut their teeth off other teams that were equally as good. Those Detroit Pistons that beat yeah. them up every year. Yeah. Well, the That's Pistons, right. we, before Mike started winning, he had to go through Milwaukee every year. Yep. You know, I mean, so you you had Milwaukee, you had New York, you had New Jersey, and these East Coast teams in Cleveland and Indiana. I mean, these these teams were not shabby. These teams, if they played now, these teams will win 55, 60 games a year. Yep. You know? There you and, go. And, you know, it's, it's, it's difficult because a lot of times these uh, smaller markets don't get mentioned. I mean, thank God for San Antonio Spurs winning championships because it exposed the world to smaller markets. Yep, that's right. Amen to that. Thank you, Terry, for, for sharing that. Ladies and gentlemen, again, we're with Terry Cummings. Uh, to me, uh, a Hall of Fame basketball player, but most importantly, he's a Hall of Fame person. Again, hashtag T-C-H-O-F. In a few minutes, let's pull the curtain back. And I believe when we can connect with people is positive. Mm -hmm. Let people connect with Terry Cummings, the person. What's things about Terry Cummings that most of society doesn't know? Share that with us right now, TC. Um, I, I have spent half my life being an et, uh, introvert and this last piece of my life being an extrovert. Uh, I had to learn how to um, share myself uh, with people that had needs, you know, that I could help with. I didn't, I'm not called to everybody. I can't help everyone, but there's a group of people that are drawn to me and they really want, just like the same with you, Scott, they really want what you have uh, to offer. And I think one of those, that's one of the things. The other thing is, is that I don't chase things. I let them chase me. You know, I do the work. And um, I do what I'm given the ability to do. You know, I feel like God gives you a gift. He gives you, you know, a talent. It's your job to make that talent a gift. And, and when it becomes a gift is when you give it back to God and say, look, here it is. You gave it to me. I'm going to give it back to you. And he makes it something that we could never make. But he also, you know, in taking uh, the talent and making it a gift, you, you, you're opened up to the pruning process, which means you can continue to create fruit forever, oh, you know? Um, and the other thing is, is my, my greatest design and strategy of life was fatherhood. And, and I was not perfect at it. I, I just worked at being mature at being a father uh, to my three sons, Antonio, TJ, and Sean. And um, being able to look back over my life and know that if I could have done something different, I would have. But since I didn't, it's over and we can only work from this point on. But fatherhood had been the, the most tremendous piece and part. And then lastly, my relationship with Christ, you know, it, mm. it, it, um, it was the glue and the stream to everything because it taught me patience. It taught me how not to blow my, my early in my career, high school and college, I'd have trouble getting two or three files real quick because I was so intense and I had to learn to calm down. And it was through prayer and studying and just getting away from everything and being quiet before games that I got that calm demeanor that everybody talks about. And they would say, we don't know where he at. <laughs> we don't know what he's thinking, but the quiet guy is the guy we got to watch. There you, <laughs> you go. Know? That's silent. Yeah. You see, I, Terry, I, I love that. And thank you for being so bold and so brave and so courageous to share that intimate detail of Terry Cummings with the world. Because no what a lot of people don't know, I, I, I made the same choice. Mm -hmm. I, I was blessed to have the ability to communicate and to be a coach. And I stepped away from that when we adopted our son. And when mm -hmm. we adopted our son from South Central LA, who I can share with you now, thank you God for allowing me that opportunity to be a role model and a mentor to my son. He's now playing professionally in the country of Georgia and FIBA, and this is his third year. Mm -hmm. and it's the greatest thing that I've ever done. Do I miss the game? Do I miss being in the NBA? Do I miss that arena? 100%. But I do believe God puts us on a path 
to serve others. And I, I, I wanted to be a father so bad. And I was blessed that I got to be a father to my son, Brandon, That's good. who's over in the country of Georgia now. And a lot of people don't know that, but I'm sharing that with you because you shared something vulnerable about yourself. And mm -hmm. Terry, keep doing what you're doing, my friend. I will. I have the utmost respect and admiration for you, for the gifts that you've been given, but the tools that you are providing and how you are serving others with your servant heart. And I thank you and God bless you. Ladies and gentlemen, this has been phenomenal. This is Terry Cummings. And I hope you've taken the time to listen to this and share this and view this. And I hope that you hit that share button and share this powerful content and use this context to fill your spirit and fill your soul and go out and continue to serve and empower others. Terry, Thank you, thank you, thank you from the bottom thank of my you. heart. This has been better and exceeded my expectations. I've got nothing but love for you. Thank you for sharing it. And let's get you back on the Coast Scott Field Show very, very soon, my friend. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look forward to it. Hey, trust me, it's going to happen. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not man that's just going to talk. I'm going to back that stuff up because you have given nuggets that, that our communities and our society needs. So thank you for that, Terry. Thanks. Thank you. All right, let's share this content, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to have another outstanding edition of the Coach Scott Field so soon. That's my man, Terry Cummings. Terry, thank you. Again, hashtag TCHOF, because I don't care who you are, he's a Hall of Famer as an individual and as a person. But yes, let's put that jacket on him and let's get him into the Hoops Hall where he belongs. God bless you. We'll see you soon. Thank you, Terry. We'll see you. All right, soon. thank you, Scott.